Public spending structure, minimal state and economic growth in France, 1870 to 2010. Journal by Francois Facchini and Elena Segeza in 2017. There is now a vast literature on the effects of the various functional components of public spending on growth. This contribution focuses on the effects of the composition of public spending on growth with reference to France for the period 1870 to 2010. Using a new database we show that the only functional component of expenditure that clearly contributes to the growth of French output is the expenditure which is aimed at the protection of property rights. Public interventions in support of the economy, on the other hand, have no impact on growth. In the area of social spending, only health expenditure contributes to output growth. In the case of France, the empirical evidence therefore seems to confirm not only the crucial importance of the protection of property rights highlighted by neo-institutional theory, but also Smith's minimal state hypothesis. The restriction of the size of the state and the delimitation to its essential functions tends to favor output growth. 1. Introduction The literature on the effects of public spending and its components on growth is now extensive. Its most recent developments focus on the implications of the individual components of public spending on long-run growth. This research direction has been driven mostly by the endogenous growth hypothesis, according to which public spending, if it is productive, has positive repercussions on growth in as much as it positively influences total factor productivity TFP, in other words the portion of output not explained by the amount of input deployed in production. In the context of productive, spending the function of stimulating growth derives above all from the components of expenditure, such as education, that encourage innovation. The main limitation of the endogenous growth hypothesis is that it fails to take into account transaction costs. In particular, the incentive to innovate can only exist if there is an institutional framework designed to protect property rights. This is in line with the neo-institutionalist hypothesis that growth depends crucially on the protection of property rights. Smith, 1776, North, 1990, Asimoglu et al., 2005. In this approach capital stock determines economic growth in the long run, but is itself determined by the ability of the state to reduce all risk of expropriation. There are at least two different ways in which adequate protection of property rights contributes to higher growth. On the one hand, it leads to an increase in expected profits and hence in the demand for investment goods, while on the other hand, it acts as a disincentive to individuals to devote themselves to non-productive spending. This paper seeks initially to demonstrate empirically that the spending component assigned to the protection of property rights positively influences growth. The positive repercussions of this component on growth in part offset the negative components of overall spending. As shown by both the solo hypothesis and the endogenous growth hypothesis, and as confirmed by numerous empirical contributions, as recourse to taxes has distortionary effects on spending, Overall spending leads to a fall in investments and growth. The second step of this contribution is to verify the plausibility of the theory of the minimal state, namely whether growth would benefit from restricting the size of the state and from the state focusing on performing its minimal functions, which consist essentially in the protection of property rights. This second point would be confirmed if the empirical analysis showed that the functional components of public expenditure other than those that serve the protection of property rights would have only a weak impact on growth. These hypotheses are verified with reference to France for the period 1870 to 2010. For this purpose we have constructed a uniform dataset for this country using several sources. The results of the empirical analysis, especially if they meet expectations, should offer some policy indications. The paper is structured as follows. Section 2 Review the empirical literature on the composition of public spending and growth with particular attention to the role of property right protection. Section 3 Presents the data and the method. In Section 4 the empirical test is outlined and explained. Section 5 Carries out some robustness checks. Based on the results of the test, Section 6 comments on the public finance strategy of future French governments. 2. Composition of public spending and growth, the role of protecting property rights. There are two conflicting views on the relationship between public spending and growth. According to the Keynesian view, also in its more recent formulation, 
Higher levels of public spending tend to enhance economic growth. Since it leads to an increase in domestic demand for goods and services, it stimulates investments and in this way helps boost output and employment. Set against this is the neoclassical view according to which public spending has a negative impact on growth, both because it crowds out private investment by leading to an increase in domestic interest rates, and because it leads to an increase in taxes with distortionary effects on the allocation of resources. The empirical literature on the connection between public spending and growth, both in more distant and more recent contributions, has come to the basically consensus view that, at least in advanced countries, an increase in spending and government size reflect negatively on growth. This conclusion, however, is regarded as worthy of criticism since the neo kolekian hypothesis is based on the assumption that the rate of capacity utilization is variable. This assumption implies that the equilibrium rate of utilization may diverge from the target rate of the firm. Thus, neo kolekian models are said to suffer from so-called Herodian instability. The endogenous growth hypothesis, according to which certain types of public capital expenditure have positive effects on growth, has been confirmed in various empirical papers. Various scholars have tried to empirically analyze the growth effects of expenditures focusing on the functional categories of spending, e.g. expenditures for military purposes, education, health, justice, infrastructure, etc. Health and education support the development of human capital and individuals' productivity. Given that better health appears as a significant determinant of a country's economic growth, Bloom et al. 2004, health expenditures are supposed to be growth-inducing. A positive impact of health expenditures on growth is found in the empirical analyses provided by Gima Brempong and Wilson, 2004 who focus on North African countries, and in those by Rivera and Cray, 1999, and Veraldo et al., 2005, who focus on OECD countries, Romer, 1990, and, more recently, Blankenau and Simpson, 2004, emphasize the effects of education on growth. In some papers, then, also the interdependence between the various components is taken into account. For example, Good health levels improve children's ability to attend school and thus the productivity of spending on education. Remaining within the context of endogenous growth, a large body of research has explored the possible relationship between infrastructure spending and total factor productivity, and resulting economic growth. Seminal works in this field are those by Ashour, 1989, showing that private and public capital are complementary, by Munnell, 1990, showing that labor and public capital are also complementary, and by Garcia Mila and Maguire, 1992, who demonstrate that road facilities contribute to economic growth. Their argument is that an increase in infrastructure spending has positive effects on the productivity of both private capital and labor, as well as generating growth of output and income. Easterly and Levine, 2003, support the thesis of a positive impact while no support is given in, among others, Bose et al., 2007. Canning and Padroni, 1999, analyze the effects of infrastructure spending on growth and find an inverted U-shaped relationship with some countries on either side of the growth maximizing level. Despite numerous empirical papers supporting it, as shown by Aguian and Howitt, 1995, page 117, the fundamental limitation of endogenous growth theory is its lack of attention to institutions and transaction costs. Indeed, in the market equilibrium model, entrepreneurs have little incentive to invent because there is a free rider problem. An entrepreneur invents a technology which reduces the production cost of a good. His technology can be used by other entrepreneurs. Nonetheless, sharing his knowledge is not in the interest of the innovator because technology will increase competition and production and will eventually bring prices down. His innovation is good for society and the consumer but bad for him. The public good nature of innovation explains the property solution or the enforcement of intellectual property rights. The protection of property rights is important not only with regard to the protection of intellectual property, but also in a wider context because it reduces transaction costs of exchanges. In this way it enables a more efficient allocation of resources. Although classical economics, from Smith to Marx himself, attributed crucial importance to the protection of property rights, only recently have mainstream economics paid attention to this.
This was mainly due to developments in the neo-institutionalist approach to economic development. As North, 1990, P.3, writes, Institutions are the rules of the game in a society, or more formally, are the humanly devised constraints that shape human interaction. In consequence, they structure incentives in human exchange, whether political, social, or economic. In a world where anyone can with complete impunity use arms to seize goods from those who are weaker there would be little incentive to save and to invest in productive activities. Individual talents would be driven to engage in unproductive activity because the threat of predation would be credible and constant. Without government, predators would impose their rules upon producers. A certain number of historical and theoretical works reinforce the idea that a world without the state would be a less prosperous world, as there would be no rules and all would be submitted to the discretionary power of groups who hold power and use violence to enrich themselves. North and Thomas, 1973. North, 1990. Cowan, 1992. The state and its government have the obligation to protect property and to punish those who violate property rights. Government can and should provide defense, police protection, courts of justice, and basic infrastructure. The major function of the state is to prevent expropriation, in other words, the failure to respect the principle according to which each must have according to his works. It places individuals in a legal framework which is favorable to economic activity and the accumulation of wealth. State failure would be when the state raises taxes to finance spending which goes beyond the protection of property rights. Taking this perspective, several economists have shown that property rights institutions have a crucial influence on long-term growth. Knack and Kiefer, 1995. Easterly and Levine, 2003. Asimoglu and Johnson, 2005. Roderick et al., 2004 even argue that property rights protection is the main factor in economic growth. North and Thomas, 1973, and Tornell, 1997, have dealt with the issue of the protection of property rights within a historical perspective, showing how growth in productivity is largely due to the development of institutions that have made it possible to reduce transaction costs. As maintained by Besley and Goddick, 2010, the mains channels through which the protection of property rights can have a positive influence on the productivity of the economic system and therefore on growth can be identified as follows. 1. The security channel, whereby a flow of income coming from an investment is adequately protected from forms of expropriation. This leads to an increase in expected profits and induces a higher level of demand for investments, also in terms of human capital. 2. The efficiency channel, whereby Thanks to the protection of property rights, assets can be transferred to those who can use them more efficiently. 3. The reduced protection costs channel, whereby individuals, feeling that their property rights are protected, are not forced to bear the costs of private security measures. 4. The transactions facilitation channel whereby, when property rights are adequately protected, The assets an individual has at his disposal can be used as a guarantee to obtain resources on the financial market. This, as shown by DeSoto, 2000, helps enhance the productivity of the economic system. Taking into account the above channels, one can say that the adequate protection of property rights reflects positively on growth because, as Barrow, 1990, notes, it leads to an increase in the expected profit, and because it has positive effects on TFP. Several empirical studies have tested the hypothesis that the protection of property rights plays a crucial role in economic growth. Abdoweli, 2003, for example, using various institutional quality indicators and considering a large number of countries, has shown that the risks of breach of contract and government expropriation negatively affect growth. Similarly, Berggren and Jordahl, 2005, find that the security of property rights and the efficiency of the tax system favor growth. Similar results have also been reached by Dawson, 2003, and Roderick et al., 2004. Starting from these observations, this paper firstly makes reference to the neo-institutionalist approach. We assume, that is, that expenditure on the protection of property rights has positive repercussions on growth. Secondly, reference is made to the minimal state hypothesis. In particular, we wish to ascertain the plausibility of these hypotheses by comparing the effects of the various components of expenditure on growth, 
in particular the protection of property rights, with those aimed at other functions. The main assumption underlying the minimal state hypothesis is that only public spending on minimal functions, in other words, on the protection of property rights, has an impact on growth. 3. Data and Methodology Empirical tests of the endogenous growth hypothesis have not proved conclusive. In fact, notwithstanding similarities and uniformities, in several contributions, certain types of spending, such as on education, health or infrastructure, have been shown to have negligible effects on growth or in some cases even negative repercussions on it. It has been rightly pointed out that most of these empirical analyses are based on cross-country or panel data, and therefore their results depend to a large degree on the set of countries being analyzed and the time period considered, Table A1 in Appendix A. As noted by Greiner et al. 2005, such types of analysis do indeed have several limits. Firstly, there may not be the same preferences in technologies across countries. For example, the productivity of public spending may differ from country to country. In some countries, public spending can be aimed at acquiring government approval or reabsorbing structural unemployment. Secondly, the institutions may be different in different countries. For example, where there are fiscal automatic stabilizers, a decrease in growth corresponds to a simultaneous increase in public expenditure, in particular in social spending. These factors can cause bias in the estimates of the effects of public spending or its components. The problems posed by cross-section or panel estimates with regard to the composition of public spending on growth are confirmed by the results obtained by recent time series studies that focus on individual countries, given in Table A2, in Appendix A. These show significant differences from one country to another. Columbier, 2011, concludes that spending on health has negligible effects and that social spending is completely ineffective. With reference to Canada, Wang, 2004, argues that while spending on education and health has positive effects on growth, infrastructure spending has adverse effects. With regard to the United States Cullison, 1993, comes to the conclusion that both Educatian and justice spending have positive effects on growth. Given these points, it would appear appropriate to make reference to an individual country using time series estimates. In this way, it will be easier to ascertain what importance spending on the protection of property rights has on growth and whether components of public spending different from this, such as on education and health, contribute to increasing output growth rate. The country we have taken as a reference point is France. The need for a long time series of expenditure data for this country made it necessary therefore to first build an adequate database. 3.1 building data on the structure of public expenditure since 1870. For the empirical analysis we built a database on French public spending and its main components for the period 1868 to 2010. In the construction of the database we used data from the state budget and the breakdown by ministry reported in different sources. A description of the way in which we proceeded and of the various sources is given in Appendix B. The public expenditure of France thus constructed, if compared to GDP, apart from the war period, appears to have increased especially after the Second World War. The increase over time of the share of public spending with respect to GDP corresponded to a radical change in its composition. This change becomes evident by breaking down France's central state expenditure into four main functions, minimal state functions, welfare state spending, support for the economy, and spending on financing. In order to construct the time series relative to these four functions we used French statistical directories, Annuaire Statistique de la France, ASF, and the tables of the French economy, Tableaux de l'Economie Française, TEF, for recent years, and the Finance Act project, Project de Lois de Finances. The reconstruction of the data based on these sources, carried out in the way described in Appendix B, have been aligned with those contained in NC publications. The period considered is from 1868 to 2010 and the data are at current prices. The spending trend for the four main functions mentioned above varied. 3.1.1 Expenditure on the protection of property rights Today the main method used to determine the degree of the protection of property rights is survey data. These data have been obtained through interviews. From the results of these can be drawn indexes such as the International Property Right Index, 
IPRI, or the Economic Freedom Index of the Fraser Institute. Indexes of this type are not available for the past. Hence the need to use proxies to measure the degree of the protection of property rights. This work uses the sum of the components of expenditure whose purpose is to protect property rights, figure 1. The use of this proxy, if it regards several countries, could be distorted by the fact that public administrations can differ in terms of efficiency from one country to another. The reference here, however, is to only one country, and thus it is to be presumed that the efficiency of the public administration has stayed similar over time. 3.1.2. Spending on the welfare state. The welfare state constitutes a great diversity of spending, figure, 2. Indeed, the state can intervene in all domains of economic and social life of an agent, health, housing, childhood, education, etc. Figure 2 shows that the quota of this type of expenditure increased significantly in the period after the Second World War. This process is similar to that to be found in other advanced countries. Within the sphere of welfare expenditure the increase in spending on education and employment and health has been particularly high. 3.1.3. Spending to support the economy. Government intervention to support the economy is represented by subsidies to agriculture and industry. The evolution of the share of these interventions with respect to total expenditure is shown in Figure 3. The Ministry of Agriculture was set up in 1881. The political elites of the Third Republic wanted to modernize rural France to create a sense of French nationality and to strengthen the Republic lastingly. Industrial policy promoted grand projects and sought to make use of economies of scale in technological sectors. Starting in the 1970s, at a time of gradual reduction of the importance of agriculture in the French economy, public financial support for this sector fell progressively. During this same period financial backing for industry increased considerably. 3.1.4. Spending for state financing. This component mainly covers expenditure on public debt service. Since 1868 this component of expenditure has been an important part of public spending, figure. 4. It fluctuates according to the state's public debt and the manner in which it is managed. Of course, wars forced the country to borrow to finance its arms spending. Consequently, this component of spending reached its peak after the two world wars when the burden of amortizing the debt contracted in previous years was at its maximum and it became necessary to carry out reconstruction. 3.2. Methodology. The theoretical framework used here is an extended version of neoclassical theory. As demonstrated by Barrow, 2013, this view can be summed up, for the purposes of an empirical analysis, in this simple equation. Where delta y is the growth rate of output per capita, y is the current level of output per capita, and y is the long run or target level of per capita output. For a given value of y, the growth rate of output per capita depends on y. In turn, the value of y may depend on exogenous factors and government policy decisions. The government, for example, may wish to promote growth, as suggested by the endogenous growth hypothesis, increasing spending on education or health. Or, alternatively or as a complement to this, it may make sure it offers adequate protection of property rights. For the purposes of capturing the effects on the growth of the various components of public spending the long-run equation to estimate has been specified as follows. The dependent variable, delta, GDP, is the annual growth rate of real per capita, GDP. The variable, INV, David, GDP, is the share of investments on GDP. In the aggregate investments are included both private and public ones. Therefore, public infrastructure and communications expenses are part of this aggregate. Lab, David, POP, is the natural logarithm of the share of labor force with respect to population. Oil is the natural logarithm of the real price of crude oil. This variable picks up the shocks, both positive and negative, as they affected growth, which came from variations in the price of oil. TOTEXP, David, GDP is the total government expenditure net of public investments on GDP. EXPI, David, TOTEXP, are the various components of public spending, measured as shares of total public expenditure, aggregated according to a functional criterion.
Therefore, the following variables are introduced. Wealth, which is the sum of education, housing, and employment and health. Figure. 2. Econ, the sum of expenditure on agriculture and industry. Figure. 3. And, fin, spending on financing the state. Figure. 4. MINST, a measure of minimum state expenditure, given by the sum of government expenditure on defense, foreign affairs and security. Figure. 1. As anticipated above, given the lack of indicators based on surveys, this component of spending is taken as a proxy standing for the degree of protection afforded to property rights. The problem which can be present in our equation. In particular, the level of public spending can depend on the output trend. It may tend to increase in recessive phases and decrease the in expansive phases. The sample period is 1868 to 2010, the of automatic the period from 1940 to 1945, to other co for which there are no data, like the ECM, the description and the sources ARD of the variables are given the table of remedy one of the appendix B, and that the estimate well, is valid B2 both when the regressors are exogenous and when they are endogenous. We estimate E2, as shown by Pesser and Shin, by the autoregressive lag. the ARD with an appropriate number of lags makes it possible to overcome auto and subsequently problems. developed by Pesser and Adol. As stated by Nakoro in 2016, we have chosen this methodology for Since various the underlying variables. First, this, this methodology should be applied also when regressors are endogenous, and this is a problem which can be present in our residual correlation. In particular, the level of public spending can depend on the output trend. The ARD may tend to increase in recessive phases and decrease in expansive phases. Above all, this due means to the that the order of integration of the variables may not necessarily be the same. To other co-integration Moreover, techniques, since like different ECM unit root tests, the ARD lead to contradictory the advantage of remedy the order of this integration of the estimate is valid. Both the ARD methods are exogenous, as and when they are require a specific identification as shown by of the Pesser order of integration. Shin, 1999. Even when different the ARD lead to the contradictory, contradictory number of lags, makes it possible Thirdly, to overcome autocorrelation and endogeneity of explanatory variables. As stated by Nakoro and Yuko, the specific correlation among these variables and the dependent variables underlying variables stands as a single equation. Endogeneity is less of a problem in the ARDL technique because it is free of residual correlation. The ARDL approach requires three steps. First, the order of integration of the variables must be checked. Even if it allows the use of I, 0, and I, 1, variables, this method does not allow I, 2, variables. Secondly, the ARDL is estimated and the existence of any long-term relationship among the variables of interest is determined using the ARDL bound test. This test is done running an equation where the first difference of the dependent variable is regressed on its own lags, on the first difference of the explanatory variables, current and lags, and on the level of the dependent and explanatory variables, lagged one period. The optimal amount of lags is chosen by the minimum Schwartz Bayesian criterion, SBC. The test consists of an F test on the joint significance of the level variables. The null hypothesis is that there is no co integration among the variables. All the level coefficients are jointly equal to zero. While the alternative is that the variables are co integrated, the level coefficients are jointly different from zero. The asymptotic distribution of the F-test is non-standard under the null hypothesis of no co-integration. The critical values have been provided by Pesserin and Pesserin, 1997, and by Pesserin et al., 2001. They consist of a lower and an upper bound. The lower bound critical value assumes that the explanatory variables are stationary, while the upper bound critical value assumes that they are integrated of order 1. Therefore, if the F statistic is smaller than the lower bound value, then the null is not rejected and we conclude there is no long-run relationship between the variables. If the F statistics is greater than the upper bound level the variables are co-integrated. If the F statistics falls in between the two values, the result is inconclusive. Finally, the third step of the analysis is the representation of the coefficients of the long-run relationship and of the short-run elasticity of the variables with the error correction representation of the ARDL model. 4. Estimates and Results 4.1. Unit Root Tests As anticipated in the last part of the previous section, the first step in the ARDL methodology involves checking the order of integration of the variables. To this end we use the traditional tests, that is, the augmented Dickey-Fuller, ADF, and Phillips-Perron, PP, unit root tests, 
Table 1 gives the results. As shown in Table 1 our dependent variable, the growth rate of real per capita GDP, is a stationary variable. For the explanatory variables, both the ADF and the Philip Perron test suggest the variables INV, GDP, oil, wealth, health, ADU and house are integrated of order 1, while the variables TOTEXP, GDP, LAB, POP, FIN and ECON are stationary. The result is mixed for the variable MINST, with the Philip Perron and the ADF test giving marginally different results. In the third column of the table we give the unit root tests for the first differences of the variables that turned out to be integrated. If the first differences are stationary the variables are indeed integrated of order 1, and we can apply the ARDL method. As shown in the table, no variable is I2. As is well known, unit root tests may fail to reject the unit root hypothesis if the series has a structural break. In the last column of Table 1 we run a unit root test with a structural break at an unknown date. Most of the variables do not change their statistical characteristics even when structural breaks are taken into account. However, LAB, POP and FIN become integrated, while HOUSE becomes stationary after taking into account a possible structural break. 4.3. Results. Table 2 gives the long-run coefficients of the ARDL model. Column 1 is the specification of the basic equation. The coefficients of INV, GDP, LAB, POP, TOTEXP, GDP and OIL are significant and have the expected sign. The result that public spending has negative impacts on the growth of pro capita output for France is consistent with the results of the majority of empirical contributions on the subject referred to in Section 1. With reference to this proof, the fact should be underlined that the ARDL method, by optimizing the lag of the variables, makes it possible to solve the problem of reverse causality, in other words, the fact that variations in public spending can ensue from the economic cycle. In the equation in column, 2, added to the explanatory variables of the equation in column, 1, are the quotas on the overall spending of its main functional components, that is to say, MINST, Wealth, Econ, and Fin. The decision to add to the basic equation in column, 1, only 3 out of the 4 functional components, identified in the previous section, was dictated by the need to overcome the problem of multicollinearity evidenced by the variance inflation factors VIF, test. The elimination of one of the variables relative to the four functional components, namely FIN, enables us to overcome the problem of multicollinearity. The results of the equation in column 3 show that LAB, POP and ECON are absolutely non-significant. They have been excluded from the estimates given in column 4. An examination of this column shows that wealth is marginally significant. We decided therefore to break down this variable into its different subcomponents. Health, in other words, public spending on health and social policies, 25 ADU, in other words, public spending on education, and house, in other words, public spending on housing. From the results given in column 5, it emerges that, in the sphere of welfare spending, only health is close to being significant. In the equation in column 6, therefore, of all the various subcomponents of wealth only health has been introduced. In the estimate it proves to be only negligibly significant. The results given in column 6, in contrast, show how MINST remains extremely significant. The impact of this variable on output growth pro capita is not negligible. Indeed, a 1 point percentage increase in the quota of MINST determines, with total public spending being equal, an increase in output of 0.11% a year, in other words an increase of 1.8 percentage points in 10 years. Proof that spending on protecting property right favors output growth is in line with the results of other empirical contributions that refer to individual countries, such as those by Columbier, 2011, about Switzerland and by Cullison, 1993, about the United States. They also show that this type of spending promotes growth. Similarly, the positive influence health on growth corresponds to similar evidence obtained in other empirical contributions on the subject analyzed here referring to individual countries, such as those by Singh and Weber, 1997, and by Columbier, 2011, for Switzerland and by Wong, 2004, for Canada.
At variance with the results of the majority of the empirical contributions referring to individual countries, on the other hand, is the irrelevance to growth of public spending on education. This difference can be explained in terms of the fact that public spending on education does not always entail the building up of human capital. This can also have other aims, such as the deferred introduction of young people into the world of work. On the basis of the results of the empirical analysis we can conclude that in France, from 1868 to 2010, the growth of output per capita a, was curbed by total government public spending b, was driven by expenditure on property right protection. Circus spending to uphold the economy appears to be irrelevant to growth. D. In the field of social spending only that on health seems to contribute, albeit slightly, to higher growth. The empirical evidence, therefore, supports the conclusion that reducing public intervention to minimal functions, as originally suggested by Smith, 1776, and in more recent times by the public choice, promotes an increase in growth. In particular, growth is driven by adequate public spending on the protection of property rights and by its more efficient use. 5. The Robustness Check To check the robustness of our results we conducted three different experiments. First of all we tested the subsample stability of our results. Secondly, we estimated separately the effects on growth of total government expenditure and those of the main functional component of government expenditure. Thirdly, we have taken as a reference point the equation as specified in column 6 in table 2, but we have inserted, as a dependent variable, in place of the variation of current output, its average variation in the two periods after the current one. Proceeding to the first experiment, we tested for structural breaks. The application of the CUSUM square test to the preferred specification, Colum. 6 of Table 2, suggests that there was indeed discontinuity at the time of the Second World War, Figure. 5. Given the structural break shown in Fig. 6, we need to re-estimate the equation specified in Column. 6 of Table 2 for two separate samples, the period 1868-1938 and the period 1950-2010. The results of the estimates are given in Table 3. The results in Column 1 and 2 are similar to those in Table 2 that refer to the period 1868-2010.2. As shown by the Kusum square test applied to the two equations given in Table 3, in the sub-periods considered the estimates are stable, Figure 6. The comparison of the coefficients in Column 1 and 2 of Table 3 suggests the following reflections. 1. The coefficient of MINST is essentially the same in the two periods. 2. The negative coefficient of total public spending is higher in the period after World War II. 3. The coefficients of investment in oil are smaller in the period after World War II. 4. The coefficient of health is significant only for the sample period post-World War II. The second experiment of the robustness check consisted in including total public spending in relation to GDP and its components, calculated in quotas of total public spending, in different equations. The results of the estimates of these equations for the period 1868 until 2010 are given in columns 3 and 4 in Table 3. In particular, in column 3, the significance and negative sign of TOTEXP GDP provide confirmation of the fact that total public spending has negative repercussions on output growth. Column 4 shows that by considering the various components of spending and excluding from the estimates total public spending, only the variable MINST proves to be significant. By breaking down the sample into two periods 1868 until 1938 and 1950 until 2010, the estimates that refer to these two different periods yield results similar to those in columns 3 and 4. In particular, columns 5 and 7 provide confirmation of the fact that total public spending has negative repercussions on growth. Columns 6 and 8 shows, on the other hand, that with reference to both 1868 until 1938 and 1950 until 2010 the protection of property rights, picked up by MINST, made a positive contribution to growth. In the third robustness check experiment, as has already been pointed out, we use the basic equation in column, 
6 of table 2 and as dependent variable the average of output growth in the two periods following the current one. The results of the estimates of the equations as specified are given in column 9 of table 3. These show that total public spending, TOTEXP, GDP, and protection of current property rights, MINST, contribute negatively and positively, respectively, to pro capita growth output in the two subsequent periods. The results of the estimates in Section 4 and those obtained in the robustness test support the hypothesis that, at least in France, the state contributed to the growth of the economy mainly by exercising its minimum functions, in particular by guaranteeing citizens' property. This paper enters this debate by testing whether public spending on protection of property rights promoted growth in France in the period 1868 until 2010. Given the absence of official data on the various functional components of public spending in this country, by using various sources we have created a database for the period 1868 until 2010. With this database it has been possible to bring back overall public spending to its four principal functional components. In line with the general consensus, the estimates made on the basis of this database confirm the proposition that overall public spending has negative repercussions on growth. The estimates on the repercussions of the various spending components on growth show that spending on protection of property right definitely contributes to an increase in output. This result represents a confirmation of the neo-institutionalist hypothesis regarding the importance of institutions to growth. The estimates, on the other hand, show that among the other functional components only spending on health have positive effects on growth. These effects, however, are evident only in the period after World War II. Social expenditure and spending on education do not seem to have an impact on growth. Future research could explore in more detail the connection between education and growth in France. It is indeed possible that the ways in which education impacts on growth are not picked up by public spending in this sector. The empirical evidence given above offers some policy indications for France. On the one hand, a contraction of public spending would contribute to increasing growth in this country. On the other, France would derive further benefits from a recomposition of spending in favor of function that protect property rights. These two choices of fiscal policy would move in the direction of what is suggested by the minimal state theory, in other words, a significant downsizing of the role of the state in the economy and in the carrying out of its essential functions, prime among which is the protection of property rights.